Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have with us Cliff Bar Racing's Pete Morris. How's it going, guys? Pete, so happy you're back. Uh, back on. Good stuff. <laughs> and then glad we also have. No, glad to be a pinch hitter, you know? <laughs> yeah. Help, help Thanks out for when me. I can. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing it. And our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. A uh, couple things before we get into this. If you're just listening to this now, you can rate this podcast. Please do so. You can go to trainerroad.com and sign up to become faster, like all the athletes that do around the world in over 150 countries around the world. Sign up, join, get faster. And also, we are hiring a data engineer. If you want to work with us, go to trainerroad.com slash jobs. It'd be awesome to have you. Uh, congrats to all the athletes at Ironman Wisconsin. You endured insane conditions, like insane. You know they're rough if uh, if... The Hoff himself uh, it doesn't finish the race. You know it's really tough. So uh, really tough conditions. Ironman Atlantic City, Santa Cruz, Sunshine Coast, Michigan, all that. Good job to all of you last weekend. Tons of racing. Now that John's a triathlete, he's just like, forget about any of the road stuff. Just <laughs> I'm not like, congrats to all the triathletes. Welcome, welcome to the triathlon podcast. Yes. Uh, uh, how, how do you spend all your time? I mean, isn't it a long time to watch that many triathlons? Day in and day out. <laughs> it is feet. You're right. <laughs> uh, and then also, but good luck to all the athletes doing Shawam again coming up this weekend. There's, uh, in fact, we're going to talk about it in this episode with one of the questions that uh, an athlete has submitted. And you can submit your questions at trainerroadcom slash podcast. Uh, let's get into some discussion points really quick. First things first, Nate, you and I, uh, can we take credit for this happening? Uh, for well, the discussion last week, we obviously are manifest generators and create <laughs> the world with Thank our you. thoughts and feelings. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly right. Keegan was selected by USA Cycling to represent USA at the Road World Championships. So uh, we were pro, talking all pro peloton highest level. Here it is. Yep. Exactly. Uh, we were talking about it last week and about like if he could go there, what it would be like, you know, in terms of just racing with the, the world tour and we're going to get to see now, granted world champs shakes down a bit differently than what you typically see with a lot of world tour races. Right. Um, but I think it, if anything, actually that makes it more beneficial for Keegan in this case. Uh, would you agree, Pete? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot more like, uh, there's a lot more wild cards. There's a lot more teams with less cohesion. There's people like, We've seen radio problems. We've seen misunderstandings between teammates. It's there's there's a lot more wild cards, and so I think Keegan's the radio right kind of problems. wild cards. Yeah, radio problems. <laughs> Sorry, I know I had to wait for somebody else because I wanted to be world champion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My radio yeah. went out. Like I had a chance. Yeah. I didn't want to work for somebody else. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, can we talk about the course really quick, and then we're going to opine on Keegan's chances. Uh, so the the course, and we'll end up showing you up on screen here when we're talking about it, 168 miles or 270 kilometers, 12,667 feet of climbing, 3,860 meters. Uh, so that sounds like a, and it is a ton. I, you know, don't want to downplay that, but for the distance, it's actually not like, you know, an insanely climby race. So a lot of people here in the United States, and I don't know what this would be in kilometers and meters, but a lot of people here in the United States talk about a day when you do a thousand feet of climbing for every 10 miles as a climby day. And this is like 860 feet of climbing or 800 feet of climbing for every 10 miles. So it, uh, to give you kind of a point of reference, it's does like most world's courses are like kind of like a long, uh, section along the coast in this case, but a long section that isn't laps. And then after that, a ton of laps. Uh, in this case, it does a long section along the coast, a big climb that's going to be probably like 15 to 20-ish minutes, probably closer to 15 for all, how fast they ride. And then after that, a descent back into town. And then in the town, they just do 12 laps, um, just jo do 12 laps. John, we haven't mentioned, <laughs> where is this race? Wollongong, Australia. I, and sorry, Australians, I probably mispronounced it, but... Uh, that's as close as I would get there. So this is the, the interesting thing about this one is that the climb that's like the long climb before they do the laps, like I said, it's going to be around 15 minutes. It only averages around like six ish percent. So it's not really that steep, but if it's 15 minutes or so, and you have people pushing really hard, I think they'll shed dead weight, even though at that point, uh, geez, how many miles will they be in? They'll be 20 miles into the race. So really not that far into the race either. Um, Pete, do you think it's going to shed dead weight and we'll see like the race actually get decisive there or no? Uh, you know, I feel like that's when the breakaway, the world's breakaways are always pretty big. Um, 
And so I feel like that's going to really shape the way the breakaway is going to be for that race. And I have to imagine that the teams that are in control of like the rolly sprinters who are keeping it together will take that climb super easy to make sure that, you know, they're not worried. They have like 130 miles afterwards. Yeah. So I, I sort of feel like there'll be a big like decision in the Peloton to take it pretty mellow and the breakaway will be insane to get, to get up the road on that climb. Yeah. Because once they drop back into the city and they do the loops, there's lots of turns, lots of roundabouts, it kind of rolls for a bit. And then it has a really steep climb every lap where it's going to pitch like up to 25%. Um, the climbs that they're pretty short in nature, like they're like 0.3 and then 0.5 miles. And if you put it all together, you know, it's just under a mile. Um, and I think that it averages somewhere around 9%, uh, but super steep pitches. So that's going to be really tough for bigger riders to, to hang up like a, a, because it's a sprint finish, a flat finish, but still, if you, you're going to get shelled, if you can't hang with that, that's going to be really hard to do. Well, when you were talking about the 15 minute laps, like imagine climbing for a third of the lap, descending for a little bit, and then the rest being technical, like there's no, there's no relaxing for mm -mm. hours, hours and hours and hours. <clears throat> I want to go back and talk about this thing. So you start Please. at 24 miles of flat. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts. Do we know if wind is an issue? I just looked at, at, at some wind. It changes during the day, yeah. uh, at least today, but it could be a, it's on the East coast of Australia. And it's kind of like think, Southeast almost It's getting toward that corner. Yep. Yes. But to the right of them is the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, but, yes, indeed. <laughs> right. And they're they're going down the coast, so there could be a crosswind from left to right, uh, yeah. depending on the time of day. And what I just saw today, I don't. Hopefully, an Australian can help us out here. But it looks like, as many coastal towns, it could shift, and that shifting wind could make really. Um, you're gonna have to respond to that, right? Because yeah. uh, breakaways and drafting and up even up this huge climb. And now, if we look at the climb. That and is one, the one, that one really thing. One thing before you go on to the climb, Nate, you bring up a good point. I looked at the wind patterns. It was like for the last 30 days and then up into the 10 day forecast. And there seemed to be no consistent rhyme or reason to it, but it's pretty common to see it actually come kind of like a head crosswind. So when they're riding, it'll kind of be like coming from their face, but slightly to the right across their left because you're getting, there's like some prevailing wind patterns, I guess, down there, but locals let us know if that's wrong. But that could be the case and it could favor, a, you know, keeping your nose clean if you've got yeah. a huge amount of that. That keeps, so when there's a head crosswind, that keeps the peloton together, especially then if they're going on a climb with a head crosswind. And looking at here, I go on Strava and I look at the the KOMs, uh, the top, you know, rider of all time on this one. And it is 14 minutes, uh, a VAM of 1500 and a speed of 15. And now these Which athletes, they have one 15 miles per hour. Mind, one thing to keep in mind too, that one, it seems like that's a segment, but that it doesn't include the full climb that they're doing for this race. They carry on climbing for like another half mile or so after that. Oh, yeah. so. But either way, my, my point on this is that that VAM of 1500, their VAM is going to be close to 1900 or 2000, probably 2000. unless there's a, yeah. yeah, unless there's a strong headwind. Cause if there's a strong headwind, they'll probably back it off a little bit because, uh, mm. there's no point in doing that. It's not going to tire the people out. But at 15 miles per hour and their van that high, they're going to go up that thing, you know, 17, 18 miles per hour, which I'm not sure what is in kilometers, but that's going to be a drafting climb. And I don't, I know there are short pitches that are very steep on this thing, but I could see it staying together pretty well. Mm -hmm. If you're going 18 miles per hour for the people who could hide in there, Pete and I would get dropped. Yeah, and obviously. it's still so early. <laughs> kind of like, like it's, it's yeah, exactly. And like Pete said, you know, the teams, I, I can only imagine Belgium is going to have, I mean, they have Remco who just won the Vuelta and they have Wout van Aert, who is a motorcycle and they have like a huge, just that they're so strong. The whole, they have so many riders to pick from. I bet you're going to have big, like a handful of countries that are really doing a good job of controlling the race and dictating it. And that's just really early on. So even though it looks really big on the profile is like this big spike, I don't think it'll be that decisive really. Do you, you, know? do you think anyone will attack before? Well, I guess someone will attack of course, before the uh, big sure. climb, but yeah. for sure. I think at how it's going to play out is not many people are going to get dropped at all on the big climb. Then afterwards there's going to be a huge Peloton. And then based on the wind, that's going to be breakaway after breakaway because of these like, let's talk about the next part. It's 12 laps <laughs> with really punchy. It's like a minute 
interval and then you get like 30 seconds and it's a two minute VO2 max effort. Yeah. That's and that one is steep enough where it's like what 13% or something where you're it's, not going to get it. There's pitches up to 30. They said on a preview video, um, looking at Strava, it looks like somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere close to that. Those are, that's really steep, man. That's like, that's so steep. <laughs> so not <laughs> you know? non drafting unless there's a, a headwind. Yes. Right? Yeah. And if there's yeah. a tailwind even better, because then mm-hmm. there's like absolutely no drafting and, uh, it actually favors you to have a little gap to have more, uh, wind For pushing sure. you up. And then the finish yeah. with this one, you climb and then you like kind of get down to the coast and there is a little, like, there's enough of like a roller. I think it's like what two K to go is what they said in the preview video. There's a little bit of a roller, um, along the coastline and that roller probably will be decisive for the folks coming in toward the end. But I feel like with most wor- roads or worlds courses, it's going to be whittled down to such a small group with 12 laps with that super steep climb. And then Pete, like you and I were talking about, if a team's on the gas before that climb through all those turns and roundabouts where it's kind of rolling, Oh, that's the yo-yo effect. Can you imagine? It'll be brutal. Yeah. I think, I think the, it's going to be like lost with positioning, honestly, right? Mm -hmm. Like the people who aren't positioning themselves well, lap after lap after lap, like you just can't hang, you can't make it through uh, a hundred plus miles of that. Um, yeah. And, you and think every time like you a make a mistake, well, it's like the, the sad climb, like being, being top 10 wheels or top 30 wheels into the climb, like then you're taking the climb at only, uh, I don't know, 140%, <laughs> 150 versus the people who are trying to make up position and claw back on. Like you can only do so many three minute efforts at yeah. 200%, right? Are you thinking then it's going to be more of like of attrition, Pete, where like every lap it's going to whittle down? I think so. Um, I have to imagine like they'll try to keep it at a pace that seems controllable, but it, like Worlds is so uncontrollable that I bet maybe the first five laps of the climb will be a little okay. And then after that, it won't matter anymore. And people, people maybe, what if they lose 10 guys a lap for the last 10 laps? Like that would be pretty crazy. John, what do you think is going to happen? How do you think it's going to play out? I love I this wanna, too. Yeah. I want to ask Pete one question on this because yeah. like a rider like Mads Pedersen, he's incredible. He can do so much, but he's a bigger guy too. Relatively speaking, mm-hmm. like there's like him to Michael Kwiatkowski, right? Like Michal is so small compared yeah. to him. There's like, he's like two of them. Right. So, and if, and there's no arguing physics and you're getting onto 30% climbs. Now Mads Pedersen has also been a world champion with steep climbs in it and he can do incredible things, but do you think riders like Mads Pedersen, Peter Sagan, that are a bit bigger can can make it on this course? Or do you think this is going to go to a smaller rider just because of how steep that climb is every lap? I have to, f- I kind of wonder what the descent is like. Um, like that, that mitigates some of the damage of the climb, but man, I like Nate and I can attest, if you're bigger, even in the realm of 10 or 20 pounds heavier, 20% grades are absolutely different than 10% grades or 5% grades. And it doesn't matter how hard you try and how fit you are. Like the fit, like you said, the physics just aren't on your side. Um, so I have to imagine it's going to be someone on the like sub 150 pound range. Alaphilippe kind of level, right? Like yeah, poppy. it seems made for a rider like that. I, I'm trying to think of like the raw Watts that somebody that weighs 180 pounds, 175 pounds would have to do to go up that. And it's got to, and at the pace they're rolling, he's probably going to, they're going to be rolling like 600 watts two minutes, at least. Not 900 for two minutes, I bet. To like, if yeah. you're like our size for two uh, minutes. Just to Matt, hold on. Matt's Pedersen is 155 pounds. What in the world? Huge. That's crazy. He's made of, uh, he's made of air, not, not yeah, a human. Yeah, he's made of air. Um, <laughs> but I feel like he's, he's the bigger range of, and like then it's a lot more chance, right? Like, can you mm-hmm. make it to the end? Can you be there? But you've just got to be so efficient everywhere else, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Like this sort of climb forces the bigger riders into having to be hyper efficient or having to have a team that's going to be racing for them to make it happen. I I think all Philippe, is he not going? I think I heard that he was. No, he he just got signed to the world's roster. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, it's made for him, man. That's a good point. We can pause this if we need to look it up, but who are the, cause it's, it's up in the air this year, right? There's a lot of people not showing up. Can we cover yeah. who is showing up and who's not? So no Primos Roglic, I don't think. 
But Tadej Pogacar, who just out sprinted Wout Van Aert in a flat what? race, <laughs> it's yeah. just just what? I don't get that. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> uh, Remco, uh, I think is racing. I don't know. I mean, he's got to right after he wins the Vuelta. I'm sure he'll be tired, but that's I mean that's pretty darn cool that he won that. Is uh, Jonas? I assume that Jonas is racing too. He's got to. Uh, considering his team's roster and everything else, he's he's like his country's great hope for that. So I'd assume. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm curious to see. Because it really, yeah. if Aleph Leap is there, that's great. Yeah, and Vanderpool, big question mark. Who knows, right? Because he did the elevation camp that said that he said ruined his Tour de France and set him up poorly. And then since then, he's done like, has he done any racing since then? I'm not sure he has. That seems to work better with him, though, honestly, mm-hmm. right? Like, if you look at his track record, if he is, if he hasn't been racing that much, he seems to be firing on a crazy level, um, and he seems to wear down over time rather than... Must, must mean he's really good at training, right? Like... I think so. You know, um, and responds well to structure and to everything else, whereas I know that some riders, they just don't... If they just trained all the time, they just don't get to where they need to be, but, but he does... Vanderpool, I think, is strong enough. Absolutely, as we even he's broken every single rule that we thought was imposed yeah. on how you. This is a race. Amazing course for him. Yep, because think about uh. it too. With Wout Van Aert, like a two minute climb, and I know that so they have to do it twelve times. Think about doing twelve, you know, VO two intervals. But then, of course, you know they have everything else in between. But when it's two one to two minute climbs, they can make it over. Wow, showed that he could make it over, you know, 60 minute climbs in the tour. This is, this is their physiology, right? Where they grew up with cyclocross, these sorts of short, hard efforts on off like this, uh, and in mountain biking too, right? Like a two minute VO two max, a one minute, then a little bit of rest in two minutes. This is what, uh, Matthew Vanderpool is really good at. Um, Sagan can't count Sagan out three world championships. He he just got got sick. Yeah. And he just got dropped at some race this week. Um, and everyone was like, his career's over. Like his career isn't over if he gets dropped at a race, everybody. Um, and also he's shown, I think it was just this year once he, he knocked out some really good results and like one or two weeks prior to that, he was getting dropped. So like, like you said, Nate, like there's, you can't rule him out. And, uh, maybe one of the most experienced racers at like making things happen Mm -hmm. on like races that are like odds are against you really tricky, you know? How he's won uh, world championships has always been like, yeah. how in the world is he still there? You know? Right? Yeah, you don't see him too. I'm sorry, yes. but yeah. you don't see him for the whole race, and you're like, Sagan's still there, and then he wins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there's a really, I mean, like Jonathan knows, are like the d- downhill world championships. You know, it. I feel like world championships is actually a different skill set, mm-hmm. um, and people are more adept at navigating this like uh, messier situation and like the the race. Uh, smarts and news comes through and like mm-hmm. there is a difference between racing world championships and that's why there are people that win a lot of world championships that don't win a lot of other races there's mm-hmm. like a psychological thing with Wout Van Aert that could be coming up or it's just all of us worrying about it and he never worries about it I have no clue but you know he's like known as the perennial second place in bridesmaid which the two are obviously proved that wrong so I hope yeah. he relies on that but over the prior two years, he was always coming up just short in every single sprint or it's, you know, it always seemed like he was second place and him getting out sprinted by Pogacar brought up that same narrative again. And everyone was like, Oh, the perennial bridesmaid as if he didn't completely dominate the tour, like, you know, and win every single type of stage you could win. But if that's there on those sort of one day races, when you have those sort of thoughts in your head, like I'm always the second, like something always ends up happening and I just get bested. If that's your mindset going into a race where it's just one day, anything can happen. There's no overalls, there's no anything else. And it's all for the win that can really handicap you. I think that's why an athlete like Loic Bruni and Greg Menard on the downhill side, like you said, like that's one of the best examples to see people execute on one day where it matters because everything Mm -hmm. else is part of their series Yeah, and it's a different mentality. And the athletes that can turn it on like that are just, they're, they're unique, you know, yeah, it's a much different, it's a much different piece. And like, I think <clears throat> the last really interesting part is the people who can make it over the climbs for the flat finish, right? Like it's going to be a, a really diverse group who I, I think mm-hmm. it's going to be a really diverse group who makes it to the end. And so, yeah, Tade could be there. 
and Wout could be there and Vanderpool could be there and Pedersen could be there. And like, Valverde. that's a way to, <laughs> yeah. And Valverde, obviously, <laughs> sorry. Uh, he's like uh, a curious and, case of Benjamin Button or something backwards. I don't know. Yeah. He's the same. Yeah. He's frozen. Yeah. In time. Um, yeah. But that's a crazy sprint group. Right. And with mm-hmm. 2k of relatively flat and yeah, there's the kicker, but if you're, if you made it to the last lap, you're going to make it with that last kicker. I'm pretty sure. And yeah, that's yeah. a different group than we've seen finish any race this year. So can we talk about Keegan now and what we well, think? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, Nate. Uh, I want to do, I want to hear, I want to say, um, I want to, cause I love the predictions cause we can come sure, back sure. to this and like, yeah, yeah. like make fun of each other or razz each other. And we all are probably going to be wrong, but John, what do you think how it's going to play out? Then I want to say how I think it's going to play out. Uh, so I think that Tade is going to win, uh, Pogacar. Oh, that's, I wasn't gonna go that far. Yeah. So I think he's going to win. Um, and I think that he's super fired up after the tour and like it getting second place and just getting outridden like that, that's got to fire him up. And he, I don't think he really loses much. And I don't know if he's really lost much in his whole life. And the way he won that sprint against Van Der uh, was shocking. Um, so I think he wins because he's one of the best climbers on the steep stuff. Even like if you saw a rider like Sepp Kuss, who is a quite literal mountain goat, and that's where Teddy Pogacar, who doesn't look like that mountain goat, still can out climb at those points. So I think he's got everything covered. Uh, I Is think he... that Wout would have to climb harder on the steeps than Tade. Um, the only thing that's tricky for Tade is the lack of team. So he won't have uh, a big, strong team around him like Wout will have. And Vanderpool is going to have a pretty strong team. Uh, so he's obviously going to be in place. So it's really up to Tade to just be a barnacle. You know what I mean? Like hook on to the other teams and to because it'll be pretty straightforward what they're going to do with those teams. It's going to be easy to predict that, um, except for Belgium, maybe if they, if Remco's feeling good, then who knows, but I Does think he have he's a in good, a good spot. Uh, I think of him as having better, like long power and not like a VO two max super two minute punchy. rider. He's super punchy too. I, I always see him punch and then sustain, but like yeah. if the punch is like 10 seconds and then sustain, not like a two minute, two like minute dropping hit. people thing. Yeah. Like a two minute hit over and over and over again. I'm thinking of Strada Bianchi this year. He did some absolute insane efforts that were like two to five minutes. And then he ended up sticking one thereafter that was absurd, you know? So I do think that probably at the shorter, harder efforts, Wout and Matthew are going to be better at that stuff, but I still think he's going to win. Here's my, okay. My prediction is doesn't break away or doesn't, you know, break up on that big climb. And then, uh, it stays, relatively chill until about not relative chill. So it'll be hard each time, but after the eighth one, that is when the favorites are going to break. Uh, cause how many are they? 12. They're well, going to really go yeah. hard <laughs> after eight and it will be whittled down on that. Cause everyone's going to be hard. And especially if there's some wind, then there'll be a small breakaway of the favorites and Keegan. And that'll be like five. That's a key <laughs> point. Nate. That'll be like five hours in. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, that's like, that's a point where a lot of riders you're getting beyond your depth racing at that sort of pace, you know, at, and at the world tour level, I would be far out of my depth at 10 minutes into this race, but yeah. they will be far mm-hmm. out of their depth. Some riders at five hours in trying to hold on to this pace. But and two, cause the teams aren't as deep and as well organized. I think the ability to pull someone back, especially if there's wind of a group is going to be way less. And then when there's that small group of, let's say three to five riders, like, um, that is when something magical can happen. And we can, let's talk about Keegan because we can just pretend yeah. that he's going to be in it because uh, yeah, we all yeah. want to. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What one thing can I really, I don't know if, if all of Philippe is feeling good and ready. I know his team boss was like, he shouldn't be selected for worlds and stuff. So I don't know what the deal is there. That's what you would say though. Right. Cause if you totally yeah. like, I'd be like, Julian, yeah. no way he's gonna, he yeah. shouldn't be there. He's going to be bad. Don't cover him when he goes solo breakaway yeah. at the end. Like he always does. <laughs> he's just going to blow up. Yeah. <laughs> The one thing I think that kind of goes against him in this one a little bit is he's going to need to be with like a decent group at the end because this after that climb, it's kind of flat for a bit and then you have the little roller punch that comes in. And I think that Tade has a better chance at sticking something if it's a long bomb from the climb on the last lap. I think Alaphilippe has to be with some sort of a group where he blows it up before that little roller and then he'd be able to get over the roller and make it stick. But he's... 
like one of the most dynamic cyclists ever. Like it'll be crazy to, to see how he ends up doing. Pete, who do you think will win? Um, I'm going to go with Vanderpool, I think. Ooh. Because uh, the freshness we were talking about, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the depth matters less if you're fresher. Like he should be able to go a little deeper, a little longer. His team is so strong. Um, and if you're not worried about anything for the first four hours, and I think the biggest thing that people are not considering is the technical nature. And so if you're relaxed in the technical four hours that you're going to spend going through the roundabouts and the tech and the downhill, then you're going to be such a different rider. And so I think part of that last selection will be the people who are technically savvy. And then I'm thinking it's going to be 10 riders mm. on the la- that hit the last climb and then four or five or something like that um, after that. Yeah. And sprint, sprint at the end, Vanderpool. I think he's, uh, he has the best sprint out of the five who are going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. And Keegan, Keegan will get third or fourth. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about that. Nate, what do you think? How do you think Keegan's going to do? Well, this is not the course that I would design for Keegan Same. for his physiology. The, uh, the one to two minute punches are, that's the, like we talked about before, if there were long climbs, that was just attrition. And yes. then like a hundred thousand degrees and at 40,000 feet elevation, like, you know, starting that yeah. would be really good for him. Uh, but little like good one course, to two minutes. Sh- yeah. One to two minute, like short punchy things are going to be hard for him, uh, relative yeah, to the top in the world. Right. Exactly. He's like, uh, I still think he's world class at that, but he's mm-hmm. not Matthew Vanderpool or some of those guys oh. at that. So they say the opposite side though, you know, when he did world cups, and he had to move up so many rows in mountain biking. This mm-hmm. is the kind of effort he'd have to put out. I think we argued that to move up like that, you have to have to put up more power than the, the top people because you don't have clean anything. And in mm-hmm. this race relative to mountain biking, it's going to be way easier to have a uh, clean uphill and to be able to hide. Uh, you know, Keegan's a small rider to have, mm-hmm. he's light. How much is he now? One forty. He'll be, yeah. One. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's that in kilograms? uh probably 65 yeah so check yeah 63 63 63 and a half so then that if he's just stays in there and stays in there that could be good Mm -hmm. um and then the pop of like getting to a breakaway or something like that it i just think the so many i mean if he if he won world championships, this would be the greatest like Cinderella story of all time in cycling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. That would be would. incredible. So we just got to acknowledge like I, we really want it to happen, but, uh, sure. Yeah. It would be amazing. But if it, what we've seen when people come in like this, we saw it in the Olympics with the women's Olympics, right? Somebody goes off and they go, wow. And you know, Vanderpool and Ella Philippe go, they look at each other and go, I'm not chasing that. Especially if there's a headwind, if there's a head or like a head cross, Mm-hmm. And there's a little gap. They're like, who cares about that? Let's look at each other. Um, yeah. Those are the situations where the person who nobody knows about, who's a gravel mountain bike racer, it can get a gap and keep going. Yeah. And that is the, that is the exciting part. And I think even if, uh, if it, this is, if it's not Keegan, it could be somebody else that people don't know about if there's a bunch of favorites and somebody relatively unknown not sure. relatively unknown, but relatively not a favorite that's always like the like you said with anna kiesenhofer what she did at worlds like yeah that's just the solo. cool thing about worlds like you know somebody shows oh, up was it and, was the olympics or worlds i thought it was olympics uh yeah it was the olympics forgive me yep yeah, yeah yeah she's amazing she just won another race solo like that by the way she just like went off and everyone was like that's foolish and she like made it exactly. she just rode the whole stage solo and made it happen yeah. she's amazing uh pete what do you think about uh how this race is going to shake down for keegan i'm really hoping that the american team like just hangs out and waits until the end and lets the race decide um yeah, i think the tricky I, part because nielsen I, palace wasn't going to be a part of the team yeah and then now he's a part of the team and I could totally see, I don't know who the DS is, but I could totally see the DS before just being like, Oh, you're a bunch of Mavericks. Just go out there and have a great day. Yeah. And now that Nielsen palace is there, he's kind of like, all right, maybe now we've like try to race as a team. And if that's the case, uh, even though I love watching and cheering for Nielsen palace, I would be bummed to see that happen because I Dude. think that that nullify, cause no way that the DS goes, all right, Nielsen palace, you're going to ride for Keegan Swenson. 
who has never done like a world tour race before. You know, I, I wouldn't exactly. think he would dedicate the team to, the, to him, whereas I do think he could dedic justify dedicating the team to Nielsen. Although I'm still not sure that even gets you like a podium, right? So if that's not the case, then you know, why even dedicate the team to it? Why not just let him go solo? Did you hear though that Keegan's radio broke? And the 2022 world you know, I heard, Yeah, I heard his <laughs> hearing's really bad, actually. Yeah. Um, no, but honestly, too, though, too, Keegan doesn't want to, in his first pro race, be like, I'm not going to do what the DS says. Totally. And then yeah. have that kind of thing where, like, yeah, this Keegan guy, he's just going to go do whatever he wants. So, yeah. and um, then that could, any like career in that is kind of over. Uh, if mm -hmm. that gets around where he's just going to be this solo mountain biker who's going to like ride for himself and not for a team, because nobody wants that. Like, uh, totally inside of it. So that he might have, uh, handcuffs on, but you made a huge, huge, important point. This is his first world tour road race. I think, I mean, I, international I road his, race. I think his biggest Keegan, correct me if I'm wrong. I think this is the biggest race you've done is Utah state championships. <laughs> so, <laughs> In road. Like, Utah state championships. At the world champs. <laughs> the world champs. <laughs> but road, so, I mean, he's done, he's done world cups in a uh, mountain biking and totally. you know, ridden with world champs and stuff, but, yep, uh, yeah. and is a national is champ crazy. in us for mountain biking, but, it is very crazy that this is your first like road race in, in uh, not Europe, but international is yeah. the champs. Uh, so Has that Pete, happened before? I, I don't know. <laughs> Probably actually. <laughs> Probably I bet it happens a yeah. ton. I bet like the fringe, the smaller countries, right? They would just like mm -hmm. send their best. Um, Pete, so I interrupted you there. If the team does like, it depends on the team dynamic is where you left off. But what do you think? How do you think it'll unfold for him? Um, <clears throat> I really hope that Keegan's fitness like carries him. Um, I have to imagine he's on, he's on one end of the spectrum at worlds, even though he's a mountain biker. Um, okay. and I'm hoping that the climbs actually won't be that impactful to him. Um, and so he can keep his head on straight and be helpful to Nielsen and like the ideal scenario, I based off the handcuffs that Nate said, like, I'm hoping that when there's only 20 or 30 guys left, hopefully Keegan and Nielsen are still there. And then there's a new opportunity, right? And then that's when the DS is going to make the right, can make educated calls like, hey, we're not going to win, you know, with the group that's here. What can mm -hmm. we do with our two riders who are still left? And I think Nielsen has a better chance of following the right moves and doing the right things. Send Keegan up the road with like 20 miles left, right? Yeah. Who cares? Uh, and Just solo. It's all, yeah. It's, Get some TV time. Someone will, someone will go with him, right? But like, that's, it'll be the first time that, the U S has had a chance to like actually make a race hopefully. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and Keegan just do all of that, please. So that we were <laughs> correct. Uh, so <laughs> save your matches, <laughs> save your matches, attack with 20 miles to go and let us know how it goes. I mean, honestly, like the, for Keegan's physiology, the best would be like 40 miles to go. It's a small group and he just solos and the people just yeah. go, we're going to get him later. And yeah. then he just, he just goes and the people, the favorites don't want to work hard with each other. Uh, yeah. How long was a marathon, constant effort? How long was Marathon Worlds? Uh, or uh, the long, the like the seven hour race that he got seventh in? Oh, you mean the last Marathon Mountain Bike World Championships uh, yeah. he did? Oh, that thing was absurd. Um, I can't remember, but that was that was insane, and that was I think three or four flat tires. He would have been yeah. second a place maybe to that one. Yeah, yeah. So I I think we don't have to worry about the distance with him. I don't think we have to worry no. about the climbs. No, I mean, look what just, he's been training for. He's been training for unbound and everything else. Like seven hour days were normal for him yeah. for a really long time. And they still are like, he's like, he's just as strong as he is because what he's been doing is doing those big rides. And then he latches onto the shootout or Utah's really fast group ride thereafter. And then he like, you know, rides at the front and attacks and, and races the front of a really hard group ride with really fast riders after doing six or seven hours. Like, so he's, if, if anything, actually, because this is one thing Pete, right. About worlds, a lot of road racers are not trained for super long days like this and world stands out from that. And that's why they, there's so much attrition and the field yeah. just gets narrowed down so much. And a lot of In people are tired. Respect, yeah. yeah and world season, tours. Right? That's a good point too. Whereas he's yeah. kind of like relatively speaking pretty fresh. Like I know yeah. he did Leadville and then Steamboat. But other than that, he hasn't been doing the Vuelta, the tour or anything else like that through the summer. 
it, you could argue that he's one of the best prepared. I know this is a strong take, but I'm being like an ESPN. <laughs> we like him. Here. But you could argue that he's like one of the best prepared for a big, long day, right? Mm -hmm. Out of the rest of these guys. So, you know, it, but I think the most tricky thing, and we've seen this individually, and I bet all the listeners that are listening to this, you can all agree, when you're racing with a really fast field and you're in a pack, that has a lot of drain on you. And even though Keegan's comfortable in a group, I've ridden with him in group rides and everything else. He's good. Like he's not like he's a sketchy mountain biker that's going to take out a field or something. He's good. He's 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 fine there. He's very good. And he knows how a group moves. He knows like you know he knows all those nuances. But riding with the world's best, and like you said, Pete, with all these turns, all these roundabouts, and everything else going on, it might add a lot of load that he's not used to having, and that could mm -hmm. handicap him quite a lot. I you think know, he'll turn it off. He, that's he's the thing that. though. It's not he's a also, thing. yes, he's also really good at being like, you know, becoming intentionally dumb, right? On the bike yeah. and the kind of like turning his br sections of his brain off so he can just do the other stuff. But that could, like the descent, there's no, with nothing on the descent that's going to be like, oh, it's going to favor a mountain biker. There's nothing yeah. like that. Um, I just look at the city circuit part and I think if Belgium and we have the Netherlands, and we have France up at the front, and the, those teams are just absolutely drilling it through there, and Keegan's getting stuck back and yo-yoing through that and having to deal with all the crazy moving around through all that. That could be draining on him and not allow him to be able to put out everything that he needs to. That's my number concern. He, if he uses his fitness wisely, and uh, hopefully he's positioning Nielsen up at each climb, and like being responsible for someone also turns off your brain where you're like, all we have to do is get to the front over and over mm -hmm. and over. Right. Like, I don't think the fitness is going to be a problem. So if he, if he wraps his head around being at the front, being near the front for the technical session sections, being at the front for the climb over and over and over, maybe he can kind of remove, even though it's, mm -hmm. if, even if you're ignoring it, it's still stress. And so maybe he can just kind of refine himself at the front of the race over and over and over. I, I want to maybe get, say this last thing. John, what year did you start training or working for Trainer Road? Uh, 2013. Yeah, so 2013, John went to Interbike, and we're at like, I think we're in like <laughs> Kirk Kinetic's booth or something, and we're like, you know, kind of being mavericks inside uh -huh. of there. And there was a young man over in the booth across named Keegan, and Looked John like, he was like 12. very young looking, and John's just like, that dude is amazing. He's going to be like a superstar. Look how lean he is. Oh my gosh. And John's like, how old was Keegan then? Like He's probably 16? like, 20, tw <laughs> like 21, 23. Dude. I don't know. Like, no, that's like maybe nine years ago. Yeah. So yeah. even younger, maybe. Yeah. He's yeah. Super young. And, and, and John, it was, uh, older and, uh, just goes up in fanboys, uh, Keegan. I'm not and sure Keegan I fanboyed. I just went over and I was like, hey, man, you're Keegan Swenson. He's like, yes, I am. I was like, good to meet you. I'm Jonathan because I have no shame in meeting people. You got his number and like, yeah. like that's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. that is a, uh, to me, okay. It doesn't matter if you're fanboy or not, but you were very excited <laughs> to meet him. But I just want to say John's eye for spotting talent. Amazing, <laughs> John. Like you did it all the way back then. And you just, I, have, I don't know how, how did you, why did you think he was so amazing back then? I have to admit it was like fully interested, uh, well, like business interested because I was just like, he's a really good athlete. It'd be great to get him familiar with trainer road. That was like, that was it. Your friendship um, is a lie. And yeah, no, it's all a lie. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but then I, I, I had heard of him, watched him like, and seen his name and results and stuff in world cups and knew he was one of the best uh, racers that we had in the country for, for cross country at that time. And he was younger. And even though he wasn't beating Howie and he wasn't beating Todd Wells, he was kind of like in the mix with the rest of the guys. So I just knew he was good. And yeah, I was totally, you know, business interested. <laughs> so everything's a sham. Uh, sorry, Keegan, but, um, uh, but yeah, anyways, I, I'm, it's so cool. It's so cool that we get to see this. Um, there's also in the, in the women's race, there's a ton of, there's kind of the similar thing happening. A lot of racers getting a chance that they wouldn't. And I know this is happening for a ton of other countries that are listening to this too. So really cool race, a really exciting one to watch for all of us cycling fans. Uh, John, when is it and how can we watch? So, uh, you know, that's a great point in terms of when is it, I got to yeah. check it's in two weekends and I don't know what the exact date is. I'll check on the calendar right now. Let's pause. Um, so that's going to be on September 25th. And then in terms of how to watch it, it's 
complicated. I saw the thing on how to watch and it's geo blocked or something else in every different country. So there's a great article that you can look at on cycling news that gives you a breakdown of how to watch it depending on which country you are in. And we'll link it down below in the description. Send so that is a Sunday, that. September 25th. And it's going to be, let's see with Australia. So it'll be in the evening for the U S and pretty late for Australia then to, yep. to, to, to see it, which will be nice so that everyone, it's a lot easier yeah. to stay up late than get up early. Yep. Yeah. It's going to be a you. long day. So <laughs> for Nate, especially <laughs> for me, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. let's get I went to bed at four in the morning yesterday, uh, or today. I'm <laughs> yeah. Nice. Today. Nice. Um, today. oh, actually I've got Pete here now. Pete, I don't know if you've seen Nate recently. He's super strong. He's yeah. like, like jacked. Don't you think that Nate should do triathlon with me now? You know, I mean, he's like, think of his swim times that he would have with how jacked he is. Swim yeah. is technique, not muscle. Shh, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. Don't talk <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it's, if you have the technique, muscle matters, but it's, if you don't have the technique and you have muscle, it does not matter. What you're so saying this, is true, but it's not wanted right now, Nate. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I think, I think if Nate is going as a physical specimen, probably gym plus triathlon gets you a happy, a really good space as far as being physically mm -hmm. specimen and impressive mm -hmm. and not too physical much specimen. triathlon, just, just enough, right? Just, <laughs> just enough to like sprint. Yeah. Yeah. Sprint. Like let's turn you into a, like just ITU a monster athlete. for, for, uh, yes. <laughs> Could you imagine Aiden and ITU just like shouldering people out of the way? He's like, I'm a crit racer. Bam. <laughs> Chaos. Yeah. Uh, awesome. I'm trying to get Nate to do Oceanside 70.3 with me or do some triathlon thereafter. So when, it, when is it? It's uh, April 1st of next year. I, so I have a TT train. bike still. That seems like that's enough to make me want to do it. Right. There you go. Pete, you can swim too. You're a lifeguard. Pete's in. Good to know. You have All a right. TT bike now, Pete? It's the yeah, first time in the history of Pete. I, well, I had one in 2014 and it, I've, my wounds have healed or my mental wounds have healed from riding a time trial bike, but I got, <laughs> I bought Chad's uh, giant. So I have, um, oh, sweet. I have, I have one. I haven't ridden it. So, but it's it, not. That's true. how people, that's what TT bike ownership yeah. looks like. You have it. It's, and in you a, don't it's, a, it's it. actually in a box. Cause and I, it's <laughs> slammed. <laughs> it's going to be slammed. It's going to look good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> slammed and narrow. And yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Which I, I just, have you seen Pete's other bike, Nate, his road bike, that new Envy the bike, the no. melee. Oh my gosh. That is a very good looking bicycle. It's a, it's a good looking bicycle, but it's I think I need to Does it ride well, Pete? Rides super well. Um, no, we're not yeah, sponsored by Envy, we're, but you want to do a little Envy commercial, Pete? Like well, you're we sponsored did, by we did one. We actually did one last <laughs> time I was on the podcast. Oh, so geez. we, we <laughs> should, uh, I think, uh, just so everybody knows it rides amazing. Uh, it's really fun. Um, it also clears 35. So oh, yeah. I was also about think, thinking about maybe we should do, um, the local cross series on the melee and see, see we. what happens. We Let's switch off every lap. You're, you're going to get me a bike. Is that what's going to happen? Pete? Yeah. Yeah. We'll just, we'll, <laughs> nice. we'll relay it. Okay. We'll yeah. Get, sounds we'll good. DNF, but it's fine. I can't fit on it, but we'll make it work. Um, dropper. Post. Dropper. Yeah, there we go. They're both the same time. Everything's <laughs> soft. <laughs> All right. Kevin says, I'm finishing my recovery week this week after my A race. This will be my first plan I've done with trainer road. I love the product and workouts. In only a few months of structured training, I've felt stronger and faster than ever, even at 50 years old. Way to go, Kevin. I love that. When people are like, they say, you know, over their prime, they say endurance, like 30 is your prime. But then so many people, 50, 60, we met a 70 year old be like, it's the fastest I've ever been, <laughs> which is yeah. great, like good yeah. for them. 76, won a national championship. Yeah. Listen don't to our let, successful athletes podcast. Don't let age hold you back. As we talked about other things about, oh, you know, I've always second place. Don't let age hold you back. Well, well said, Nate. Absolutely. Uh, Kevin says I've raced on and off for about 30 years, uh, but I've never used structured training. I have a few races I'll be doing during the fall and winter. And as always, I want to do well, but want to be in the best form for next year's cross country Olympic season. I need to start another plan and don't know what to do from September to March ish. When my first race of the cane Creek series takes place. That means I bet that you're in North Carolina area, Kevin, that series looks really cool. I'd like to build my FTP, but wonder if I should just start at base or do a build block. Thanks for the advice and love the workouts. Uh, so we're kind of talking about an off season, right, Nate? Um, and what to do during it? Well, it's it's two different ones because it's the it is a 
we could have an off season where you want to refresh and kind of look around. Then you just do also plan builder. And I was going to talk about the, um, if you do have a long time or you're worried about burnout, make sure you don't do too high a volume and mm -hmm. like, just it's way better to be lower volume and be consistent over that time than to go high, take weeks off, like struggle to come back and, and have that pattern and then go on forums and be like, trainer road burns you out. And it's like, we told you <laughs> yeah. not to do that one. We recommended the low volume. We did the high volume. Uh, <laughs> yes. We should have like, the tail we have to pay us. Time. <laughs> as old as time, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, and Nate, your point about age hammers that point home even more so just because your wiggle room gets less and less, right? Like hmm. you don't recover as fast. Also, um, I don't know, maybe you're retired. You don't have kids, everything else, but in many cases, 50 years old is still a really busy time in life. That's like a, you've uh, got a lot going on. Really good point though is, hey, I'm retired. I have more time. Therefore, Ooh, I'm going to pack this week up. It's I'm going to pack it up. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a trap. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I yeah. would I would say, Kevin, like how you are feeling right now. Are you super motivated to do structured work? Do you want to do unstructured work? Um, for unstructured, you could be doing you know just like group rides and kind of use train now, pick what you want when you want, and then build towards though a like i'm gonna start this on november 1st uh or december 1st and then have a good four month build four or five month build into that race season um if you are it sounds like you know you said you would like to build your ftp uh, i wouldn't though pick the blocks yourself i would use plan builder on that and then start a lower volume and give yourself uh i don't know pete in your experience too i would rather go and i haven't always done this but like low 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 and the last block do a mid and have recovery into that big race, then mid, 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 and then go into like a low, low or a no training and then a low. What do you think, Pete? I think that um, it's really, really important to be consistent at half the volume for like the off season, right? Like I think consistency matters the most and picking things that um, make you happy. Um, so maybe do more technical rides, like do one or two more technical rides a week do a group ride where you see your friends. And then I think train now works really well, especially if you want to boost the FTP, like that's something you don't want to let go of over the off season. So you just want to kind of check the box over and over twice a week with train now. And that way you don't feel like you're already adhering to the really tight structure. You're just having fun, but that sets you up really, really well for November 1st or December 1st, like Nate said, like you want to, you want to have some traction when you get there. Um, mm. And then, but yeah, keep it fun. Uh, cause if you're going to do a whole XCO season, that's a long time after March too. That's a good point, Pete, with uh, workout levels too. If you, let's say you're, you know, you, you came in, you could do a threshold level six. Well, maybe in the off season, you try to do ones around four, but you're not trying to improve it. And if you start to go lower than four, then maybe you want to look at it and you're like, oh, I'm kind of getting a little like a level four workout, I'm kind of losing more than I want to at this point, if it's not time off, if you're actually training. But if you do a level four every week, like you're not like for your threshold in that time range. I mean, there's more parts of fitness than just that, of course. Um, it's a good way to though benchmark yourself over and over and over again. Uh, and but you don't have to push yourself forward all the time. Yeah, great point. I, if I can offer a really specific suggestion with Kevin, it would be to do train now and do one of those climbing workouts, like two or climbing or VO two, you can like do one of each, do that two times a week. And then the other time during the off season, go find because cross country Olympics. So mountain biker probably likes fun trails. I think lives in North Carolina area with tons of amazing trails in there. I would personally during that off season <clears throat> have two structure, like two, just like workouts that you do a week since this athlete wants to carry fitness and have the best season ever do those two that aren't going to push the envelope, just get those done and then go and ride fun trails that you've always wanted to ride and haven't been able to do that one or two days a week, whatever fits your schedule. Cause that really keeps it fun, keeps it fresh, keeps you motivated because you're getting to ride new trails. And as a mountain biker, that's like so much of why you ride is to experience the fun trails. And then that way you're still getting in just enough structure. Uh, this is now this is important. There's two pieces of information here that he's given us where he says, I want to do well, but want to be in the best form for next year's XCO season. So we can really look into that and see that this athlete doesn't want to lose fitness, but they also don't want to come in overcooked coming into the season. 
Now there are some athletes here where you're coming off a season where you had injuries or something happened and you just did not get to train up to the point that you thought that you would. And in that case, during the off season, it might be a great time to drop like a training plan plan block onto your calendar. Maybe you do like, uh, if you feel like you have a solid base, maybe you do a build plan and you do that in the off season and you work on a weakness or something. We've talked about this before, but maybe that's a good time to take on short power, sustained power build. If you have a season where you feel like, well, I never really got to the point where I was, you know, fatigued from a lot of training or anything like that, it can be a really good opportunity to do that. And that kind of gives you a whole new motivation going into the season. Just make Mm -hmm. sure that you give yourself enough time off after that build block to be able to kind of reset and build into the next year. I did that same thing going into Cape Epic with workout levels. It was really fun. I worked up to level 10 threshold. (laughs) Yeah. And it was like, um, but man, my fitness too, because I was like, uh, it went up a lot and I did more power sustained. Um, I think inside my PR for 60 minutes, cause it was like, it's like 60 minutes at threshold or, you know, you do a little ramp up, mm-hmm. um, was inside cause it's very hard to get that outside, uh, s- s- sustained 60 mm-hmm. minute climb, but that it was, it feels fun to get all the way up and to do those intervals and you know, wow, I can hold all that power for that long. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's another option. I mean, you know, you could still, uh, you gotta just worry about burnout and to on the plan, <clears throat> we have, we have plans to make it so you can do different times for different days on plans. Is that actually, is that out yet? Cause I think we had that built, but is, I don't even know if it's out yet. Uh, I don't think it's out. Are you talking about being, yeah, no, it's not quite out yet. Not out yet. I know what you're yeah, talking okay. about. Yep. Yeah. Um, this is the idea on, let's say on Tuesdays, instead of doing a, <clears throat> uh, mid volume, you have a 90 minute workout. You'd say on every Tuesday, I want to do a 45 minute workout, but I still want to work out five days per week. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do this now with work alternatives is just click a little button and find a 45 minute workout. You do a drop down and at the same level, we want to make that automated in the future and it is accessible to us internally, but we haven't released it yet. Um, That'll be like the most, uh, uh, like one of the most popular <clears throat> features we've launched. I guarantee it for like busy folks that are like, well, my Tuesdays, I can only train 30 minutes, but then my Thursdays I can train two hours, you know, and having that wide range of being able to work within that will be super mm-hmm. popular for people. And then inside of that, what we, the other part of that is layering red light, green light on it, where then we can, um, edit the intensity of each one dynamically. So if you did miss the Tuesday, that's the hard one. Then Wednesday could become the hard one. And then Thursday now is the easy one. And then you do a group ride on Friday and then Saturday has to change. And all, you know, all these sorts of things that happen in day-to-day life that a lot of you listen to the podcast to try to understand how this would work. We want to put this in software so that we, um, can just talk about like world tour, like world, like Keegan winning world champs, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Make my, make my life more fun. Um, the, another interesting part. So let's say that you came into the season and you're completely cooked. Like what, what do you recommend Pete for an athlete? That's just comp- like, they ran themselves into the ground for one reason or another. Maybe it's just cause they train more than they ever have. Maybe it's cause they got sick or, you know, they, they, their eyes got too big for their stomachs. Yeah, how would you that, recommend they do the off or approach an off season? I think that happens to mo- more of us than we care to admit. Right. Honestly, I feel like people end the season with a, uh, thank goodness the season's over more than, um, anything else. And I think, um, to me, uh, and as a 50 year old, like do some gym work, do some mobility work, check the boxes in a different way that makes you feel good and change how you are as a person. Think about your diet a little bit, like, push the envelope in other ways that you don't necessarily have the capacity to during the race season and experiment a little bit more with yourself. Um, but I do think that if you can <clears throat> pick other goals while you let your body recover from a long season of racing, you will not lose that much fitness. I mean, you will, it'll feel like you are, but you, uh, you just did a huge amount of work and mm-hmm. you've done work for years. Like your body will remember how to do it. Um, so if mobility is an issue or your back like tires out in the XEO races, like work on some strength stuff, work on some mobility stuff. And that will actually set you up for better success once the training starts and the racing happens. Um, And it's a nice time to like self-examine and say, okay, what can I do for myself? That's not necessarily bike riding right now. And maybe it's even like optimizing your sleep schedule, you know, little Mm -hmm. stuff like that, that will really pay benefits over the course of the next year. um, That isn't, that isn't directly related to the bike. Mm-hmm. I like the way that Amber said is, uh, if you are feeling that you take time off and do whatever f- seems good to you, and maybe it's just 
you know, we talked about this before, the permission to do nothing, mm -hmm. gain some weight, like the fitness is going to pop right back. You don't have to maintain it. That's a very huge fear for so many of us with weight mm -hmm. and power. Uh, and then once you're ready to come back, wait a couple days or wait one week when you're excited, wait one more week, then you're ready. Uh, I've done this. I've had, um, almost a year hiatus now <laughs> and actually being on the podcast and stuff, I'm starting to get the itch where I'm like, yeah. what well, sounds really good right now with weight training is like two to three 30 minute intense, like train now workouts mm -hmm. that I can get on there for fitness. Cause my, my aerobic capacity, oh my gosh, is, <laughs> is, uh, not good. And I'm almost like embarrassed. I'm like, wow, you don't realize when you're a fit cyclist, how good your aerobic engine is. Like no one can see it. And yeah. then when you start to do like a little bit of, I, I had to pick up my, uh, my son left like a soccer ball at practice and I ran like 200 yards, man, I was, <laughs> I was aghast. Like, uh, yeah. I, I'm, an, I'm an iron man. Right. And that 200 <laughs> yards and like my calves cramped up and it was, it was yeah. not good. Uh, but anyways, it's like, that's, that, it's like that meme. Like they don't know I did an iron man. Like you like off in the corner, like yeah, exactly. <laughs> you wish you could tell the world. <laughs> yeah. But it, so what I'm experiencing, I, I, I have an itch to do it now, but I want to wait a little bit more so that when it does start, I don't want to just, I want it to itch for a long time, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't want to scratch it and then be like, that's done. I want to get back that fire motivation, which it will come back and it just bubbles up. Cause I had such a, as y'all know, I was like two and a half years and yeah. hurt my head and it's very, very in the depression and all that sort of stuff is, uh, was not fun. Uh, yeah. but this, yeah. Well, I'm your perennial hype man, Nate. Whenever the time comes, I'm here to support it. Uh, the one thing I would say to in you in giving yourself time off from the bike, I've had a complicated relationship with that sometimes because I feel like I need to take time away from the bike. But sometimes I actually just want to do a, like a train now endurance ride and just being able to drop watch in TV. and do that and just like watch TV or something because I feel really good. And it doesn't add to it doesn't like overfill my bucket in any negative way. It's just nice. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's kind of, you need to approach it individually. If somebody says, cause I hear a lot of people say, don't touch the bike for X amount of time. Like don't even True. think about it. And maybe you do need to, maybe it's what you need. So, so don't, uh, and just take it, play it by ear and be, uh, true to yourself, I guess. John, for those situations too, where you are type a, and you, if you just sat home, said, Sarah, I'm going to watch TV for an hour. <laughs> you feel guilty, right? Yes. But if you're like, Hey, yeah lovely wife, I am going to decompress for an hour and watch TV like while I ride and improve my fitness, my, you know, my health and all this sort of thing. And it's like, you're being productive, but you can also don't go so hard that it's going to impact recovery. You're building yeah. your dad work, sleep and all that sort of stuff where you're not trash. We've all had that work. You have that workout where you, you go so hard and the rest of the day you're like, yes. I can't help. I can't do <laughs> yeah. anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's Those tough, are fun man. sometimes, but that's not good all the time. Yeah. I, and this is going to be a personal plug, but I have enjoyed the variety of running and swimming. Well, swimming and enjoy, that's a tough, that's a, that's a strong word there. But the variety of running, the ease of running, just putting on shoes and just going, like there's no equipment, there's no anything involved. Like it's just really simple. Man, it's been great. And my body feels better than it has in years from doing more running. I just feel stronger overall. Um, and strangely, like less pain. I've really eased my way into it, but man, it can just feel really good and it can be like a good reset. And, uh, right now looking at next year, I feel like I'm going to be really, really strong on the bike, uh, because of the foundation of just general fitness and functionality that I've built. So, and what the, the issue, the meme is the cyclists in off season go for one run, <laughs> yeah. they have aerobic engine, they run six miles at like a seven minute mile pace. And then their yep. knees and legs are shot. They have an yes. IT band issue for like a month and they don't run again. <laughs> so if you do it, the mile run to start, Oh. chef's kiss it's slow like, pace yeah i, I did it's, this is almost this is 10 months now of me working into the point where i'm i you know i can run 30 minutes every day and it's no issue you know like it's taken me that long and i started out running at like 10 to 11 minute pace which was so hard and i was only doing like a mile and that hurts my ego that was boring it felt weird to run slow just technique wise all that stuff it was exactly what i needed i because i had no prior experience as a runner at all. Like I would just go and blow myself up, like Nate said, uh, in the off season. So, and to have this technique in your, to have this in your like tool belt for fitness, where you travel 
and you know, you have like work meetings and stuff, but almost everywhere in the world, you can wake up at 6 a.m., do a 30 minute run, shower, uh, you know, take your cold shower, get your dopamine feel ready, great. and just like if you feel great, it's not bad. And you also, you know, you're hitting that aerobic engine uh, during two years, touching it so that it, uh, it kind of floats up and stays high. And also for the people who worry about losing fitness, who, you know, the ones that are addicted, it can feel very bad. And I've been the one traveling with my bike, putting trainers in hotel rooms. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is, uh, it, it, running is, we poo poo it a lot as cyclists, but it's, it's a, it's a good thing to be able to do and not injure yourself while you're doing it. Truth. All right, let's get into Adam's question. He says, I'm just wrapping up what I would consider a successful season. I had several Cat 3 wins at local crits, won the state championship for Cat 3. Well done, Adam. Nice work. Uh, I got enough points this season that next season is a mandatory upgrade, which was a goal of mine. I want to force upgrade rather than opt for it. Oh, good. That's also a really good point that we've mentioned before on this podcast, right? Is that you accumulate a lot of experience. Uh, when you are losing at the back of the field, you learn different skills than when you're racing and winning races. Uh, so it's cool to spend some time in that instead of just rush through. So good on you. Uh, I trained for 10 to 15 hours a week and developed my first structured training plan at the end of last summer to prepare for this season over the winter. I noticed a huge difference this season and I'm hoping for another level up next year. I rode a lot of base, did a lot of lifting and transitioned to threshold and VO2 max and sprint work in the couple of months leading up to the race season. So this seems like Adam put it all together himself and Adam has a lot of questions. So we're going to get into them and Pete, I want to lead with you on these ones. Uh, first he says, what can you share about the step up from cat three and three slash four races up to one, two and P one, two fields. And Nate, you have some good insight on this too. Um, as do I, but Pete, you're the crit, you're the crit God over here. So, um, uh, what would you, yeah. <laughs> all hail Thor. Uh, what would you say, Pete, uh, the big changes from threes and three fours up to P one, two. Um, this is really funny. There's a couple of guys in the local scene who are trying to do the same thing. And we've been having some conversations with them. And the biggest shift that kind of everybody needs to realize is at as a three, uh, well, depending on the person, most people as a three, you can kind of race however you want. You choose how you race. Mm -hmm. um, and you have your, your signature moves and the way you like to do things, and you do them, and you learn all these habits. Um, and at the P12 level, especially that first transition year, you're, you have to kind of unlearn everything that you used to be able to do um, and learn how to read the race and do the right thing at the right time and make sure you're using your fitness effectively. Um, because if you're making decisions, the, the, like the whip crack of the field of the P12 can punish you much differently than the threes race can. And so like the mistakes you make in the threes don't really translate to much, but the mistakes you make in a P12 field, like if you do the wrong thing at the wrong time and all of a sudden you're on the back of the field for the next 15 minutes, um, it's a way different, uh, the, the risk versus reward is much different in the P12. So you really have to like bring yourself back into yourself, really assess what's happening and what you think is going to happen and what you can, how you can fit into that instead of make and shape the race, um, which is really hard to do. And watching these guys try to figure it out, um, you can only unlearn so much so quickly. Um, and it feels really strange to, know you're capable of something and then not do it. Um, and I'd say that's like the crux knowing that you can do something, but you're choosing not to is something you have to do in a P one, two race almost all the time. Um, because that's, that's what makes you a good racer in the P one, two is doing the right thing at the right time, instead of doing the thing you're capable of doing when you can do it. Yeah. Well said, Nate, uh, what would you say? Yeah. The, the room for error is kind of what Pete said is, so small in the p12 <laughs> that if you make a mistake you could get spit out where in the three four especially with the fitness to get you know state championships and get upgraded uh you can make mistakes all the time you don't have to be super efficient because your fitness is so good and the other part in the p12 is that there's no there's nothing higher so there there will be a gap of athletes in that race men's and women's that are so much more fit than you that are crazy. And then, uh, because they, I mean, unless they're going to like domestic pro, right. And sometimes domestic pros race with you and you're, you were, you were on one state 
chance for cat three, but you're not a domestic pro at the moment. And there's a big gap between that for, um, snap speed, intensity, how, uh, people take corners, man. The first, I remember the first group ride, like the corners that the P one two take way faster than the, uh, three fours. Um, but I did drop the, the group at land park in a corner. Ha, that's on film. Uh, <laughs> um, it exists. And then the, uh, the last part are the teams, the, in the three, four, like he's not talking about a team, but it was like solo racing. And then in the P one, two, it's, it's completely different. The type of racing with teams and to have like people negative race like that, that doesn't happen a lot in the three, fours, uh, mm -hmm. negative race where they just sit on in a breakaway and you're like, why aren't you pulling? You're supposed to pull. And they're like, no man, I got a sprinter back there. I'm not going to pull like you work. Yeah. You pull me to the end and I'm just going to jump you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all, all of that stuff. And while the race is going extremely fast and like Pete said, the whiplash in the back, uh, that is the big, th those are the big differences. I, the a perspective that I would suggest for you, Adam, in this case is to try to make it your goal to learn as much as you can from every race rather than I need to finish X position in the field. Just make it your goal to observe other riders and pick up on the little things they do. Like if Pete came in and Pete was at like, you know, 80% of his prime fitness. And if I was at a hundred percent and then that allowed me at like a local race to beat Pete, I would still go to like a USA crits race and Pete would beat me because Pete has a level of fluency in racing if with high level athletes that I just don't have. And it's because Pete spent a lot of time being a sponge and picking things up and learning. And I just haven't had those opportunities. So if you can go in with that mindset of, I need to learn. So then you have this growth mindset. And after every race, you start to look back and you see, what did I, what did I do? Well, what could I improve on? What did I see out there that was done that I could try next time? And if you do that, it puts you in a growth mindset and you can accelerate that learning curve because it, the learning needs to happen. So your goal should be, how can I make it happen at a rate that's maybe faster, but of course not too fast, but how can I accelerate that so that I can get the results I want? John, what you just said is what we're talking about with Keegan, right? Mm -hmm. The, like he's never done a world tour race. So that experience is going to be much different than a Utah state championship race. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you're the fittest person probably there for like Watt KG, uh, for this sure. is very similar to Keegan is a cat three state champ winner and he's yeah. now going to the, uh, P one twos in a huge race Cat one, but yes, same thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. No, but I mean, yeah. that's just the, yeah. the ratio, right? Like U S totally. state champs for road versus, uh, uh, world championship. I mean, it's a bigger jump obviously, but yeah. he's got the mountain bike stuff and you know, all the other And wins. to be clear, I don't want to uh, make it seem like Keegan thinks his state championship is prestigious. I don't think he's ever mentioned that to anybody. Uh, it's just something that I know about as his friend. So it's not like he's, you know, making a big deal about that, um, at all. So, um, but yeah, absolutely. Good, good point. Nate. Um, all right. His next question, what plans would be best for an all rounder stepping up to cat two? One thing I really like is that Adam is a cat three who is winning cat three races and he isn't coming in and classifying himself as a specific type of athlete. He's just saying he's an all rounder. Cause that's kind of like a, like if you're winning cat three races as a sprinter, you're not a sprinter at a P one, two level. Probably you might be, I don't know, but most likely you're not quite at like an actual sprinter at that level. So this is really cool. So, uh, what plans would be best for an all rounder stepping up to cat two? I want to take this question two different ways. First, I want to do plans as in Pete, what plan strategy should this athlete have coming into cat two races? And then we'll talk about like trainer plans. I like it. I, I think that, um, you have to look at yourself with a different lens as a two, as a P one, two rider than a cat three rider. Um, and you can be an all rounder for sure. Um, and if that's really where your fitness lands, you have a lot of opportunities to win, but a small chance of winning. Um, and what you want to do is you either narrow the scope and align it better with your fitness and increase your chances of winning and decrease your opportunities. Um, and finding the sweet spot for everybody is different. Um, like if you would rather have a lot of opportunities to win, um, and you're going to go up against people who can, uh, who have different strengths, then, that's a good way to learn a lot. And if you still really are trying to figure out how, what type of rider you are and where you're most successful and where you feel um, comfortable, like going for the win, being an all rounder is great. Um, but there's, even if you have 10 or 15 hours a week, there is not enough time in the world to be good at everything, um, mm -hmm. good enough at everything. And so 
I think it's smart to pick a couple different opportunities as a race plan and focus your training on that. Um, and you don't have to, you don't have to be, I'm only a sprinter. I'm only a breakaway rider. You know, it's, it's think about who you are as a rider and where, where you've been successful in the past and line that up with your fitness and your, you know, kind of the way you're capable of winning races and pick, pick like a first, you know, like a short duration power or a long duration power. Um, and not that the rest of the opportunities will go away. You'll just find yourself in different situations with a higher chance of success. Um, so I think it's, it's really nice to like, even now, um, I, I win races differently than I did five years ago. Um, even though my power profile is relatively the same and it, it really matters about like critical self-examination and then setting yourself up for success for the steps after that. Um, I know that was a lot of words that didn't really mean that much, <laughs> but, uh, as an all rounder, pick, pick your three or four different ways that you would like to win a race, you know, breakaways, longer attacks, five lap attacks from the gun or last say getting in the breakaway, torching the breakaway in a sprint or a short duration attack or being there at the end. Um, if you, even if you want to be part of any bunch of finishes, you have to have some high short duration power. Um, and focusing your time and energy on that will make you more successful with either one of those. Um, even though the opportunities will come along slightly less often. Pete, can you describe how you used to win races and now how you do run races? Cause I think that's super interesting for all of us and what changed. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as, uh, over time, I think looking at it now, I've looked at my power numbers, uh, you know, we've all looked at our power numbers. I was definitely the fastest I ever was in like 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, and I actually won less races overall, I would say. Um, hmm. And the reason being is that I would find myself in positions um, where I didn't have a strength to match against the other people I was racing against that was comparable. And so I could get myself into, I was an all rounder. I could get myself into situations and not be able to win. And so what I started doing is picking the situations that were more aligned with, I had a better chance of winning. And sometimes that was a worse physiological, uh, like domain for me, but I knew I had a better chance of winning if I could do the right things. And so a good example is now I can really cherry pick. I, I mean, I still try to win out of a breakaway that seems to be better for me. Um, and so I'm really cautious and careful in my consideration of who's in the breakaway, who can get back up to me if I am in the breakaway. Um, and a lot more of like, let's lay the cards out and see what happens. And then there's a next gate. So if a sprinter gets along, you know, there, if there's a sprinter that gets in the breakaway, I'm not going to work anymore. Um, you know, like, let's just throw this one away because there's no way, even if it's a 10% chance of winning with the sprinter there, that's not worth it for me. I'll reroll the dice and get in a different breakaway. Um, tell the makeups right. Um, and I think the last thing is it's really changed the way I work in a breakaway for me. Like if, if a group is, if I'm not that worried about anybody else, I will work. So I will single-handedly make the breakaway stick. Um, because I know that the end is going to be much more in my favor than if we kind of cat and mouse it a little bit, a couple more people get up. Um, that's not worth it to me. And so there's a, there's like rapid shifts in what's happening right this minute. And I work less, I work more. Um, I throw away a lot of more, I uh, throw away a lot more efforts now and knowing that that's okay, but my repeatability is pretty good. Everything's still good enough that I can still make these choices, but I throw, I discard a lot of things that happen in a race. Don't ever think about them again. Okay, there's a new, we're gonna reset the deck, shuffle it again, see what happens and then wait till the one that I feel is the right move for me to win. He's more decisive is what it sounds like. Right, Nate? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, knows picky. what he can do best. And then, picky. yeah. And is picky about it. Yeah. This happens in people's dating lives. Yeah, that's exactly. Yes. Actually what I was thinking of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's funny. Good parallel. I, I, so the, I like what Pete said is pick a way that you want to win and build toward that. And that goes into the training side or two, right, Nate? But mm -hmm. I kind of feel like if you're just getting into this, working on sustained power is super important. If you're going to race a lot, 
that's going to bring about more short power. And you can probably add on to that. But what, the one thing that I found going up to P12 is just if you were to take an average FTP, not watt kg, but average FTP, it's going to be higher than when you are in the cat three field and, and not by a little bit, by a lot. And what that's going to mean is that the pace is, the speeds are going to be higher. Wind resistance will be higher and mistakes will be more costly. If you can raise your FTP, like we've talked about, when you raise your FTP, it makes everything hurt a little less. Like every attack, every punch, every time that you have to pull into the wind, it's a little less damaging to your energy levels and to the, your ability to sustain efforts. So part of me in this case wants to say, Adam, really focus on sustained work and then pick those opportunities because that could help you learn a whole lot and kind of, you know, bite the leather and hold on for the first little bit if it's like really punchy and hard and it's too intense, but you'll get that sort of sustain or that sort of punch and repeatability as time goes on. And I would vote more for sustained work to really raise that threshold. Nate, what, what do you feel? Yeah, I would come into these races and not have a strategy and just try to read the race and try things out because you won't know how your power stacks up to these athletes until you get into it. And I know later on the question, you talk about sprinting too, and those power numbers might be at different freshnesses and stuff. And there's jumping people and like uh, cat and mouse. And it, I wouldn't worry directly about those. Just read it and try stuff. And instead of like Pete, I wouldn't be super picky. I would try a lot of things and feel, see what it feels like to be in a breakaway and what the poles are like and uh, what it takes to jump people and be a breakaway. Uh, and if you do want to sit in what that lead out is, cause that's, that's one thing that was very surprising three, four versus P one, two, man, that P one, two, that train gets going four or five laps out and you're going <laughs> over 30 for that whole time. And oh, where yeah. the three fours, it's like, Oh, we're going to go like 20 and everyone's kind of like chilling. And then at the like last half lap, it goes faster. The last lap, it's almost like last lap. Now we're going to race does not happen in the P one, two, when everyone's in a group. I'm uh, a great cat three lead out guy and not a good, <laughs> not a good P one, two lead out guy. You know, like it's a totally different, different level. He always says, how do you, he also says, how do you incorporate workouts throughout the season? We've mentioned this before. Uh, if you're following a specialty plan, if you look at our specialty plans, it's probably one of the best examples of that. So when you look at that, like we drop down the, the amount of intense work that you do, you don't have as many days where you're going to be doing work that's as intense. You cut them shorter. Is that fair to say, Pete? Yeah. And I think the intensity is something that you can kind of grab onto and that will that is something you're going to become more intimately familiar with is the intensity that's required of you in the P12s is different. It's like, it feels different during the race and making decisions in during these really intense efforts are really the, like, that's what makes good racers. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like you guys were saying, give yourself as many opportunities as possible because you'll learn a lot during this first year and the way everything feels and you'll, you'll definitely gravitate towards things, but being very familiar with in more intense efforts than you're used to will definitely lend itself to making better decisions, being in more opportunities and things like that. So uh, I would say I definitely, the intensity required of my training jumped a lot um, versus what I was used to um, stepping through the ranks. Like the intensity required is very, very hard. Um, and totally. that's, that's something to, to keep in mind. That's a err on the side of caution. If you have a bunch of races back to back and that sort of thing, in, and you're racing every week, err on the side of caution, give yourself a little room. I want to jump down to Jason's question. Cause we're kind of crunched on time. Uh, is that okay? Sound good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Jason says, I was listening to the Leadville recap and heard Shawam again mentioned. And because it's part of the lifetime grand prix. I've done that and that's coming up this weekend. I've done that race the past six to seven years and it's my A race, my only race and the reason I started riding. Cross country skiing is my main competitive endurance sport and since Shawamigan takes place on the American uh, Berkabiner ski trail, I thought I'd give it a shot. Uh, he mentions these days, biking is almost as important to me as skiing and a lot of the training ideas I've learned from Trainer Road have carried over to my ski training and made me fast there, so thanks for that. My question is about pacing Shawamigan. The course is incredibly punchy. There are a few flatter gravel sections, but for the most part, it's nonstop punchy hills that take 30 seconds to two minutes to climb. So it kind of sounds like your type of course in that regard, Pete. Um, followed by downhills that you spin out on pretty quickly. 
I don't have a power meter on my mountain bike and have never had a, had a pacing strategy. I've just tried to stand and crush the hills and maintain as much of that speed into the next one while trying to recover for another uphill effort. Then when I hit the flat sections, I try to get into a group and put out about sweet spot power or slightly less. Is there a better way to pace a race like this? First of all, his strategy between the hills sounds fantastic, Pete, right? Like, you know, yeah. like, well done, um, JC, yeah. in that regard. We'll get into the nitty gritty though. Uh, other context, if it's relevant, I use plan builder to create my training plan for this year. My profile might not show it, but I consider myself pretty decent at repeated hard VO2 efforts with the recovery in between. So maybe my quote, kill the hill and hang on strategy is the right one. I really enjoy the podcast and the product. So I kind of, uh, if you, if it can, if you can, uh, endure with me here, Pete, I yes. have some thoughts on this one. Please. I think there's, there's two kind of ways that you do it. You either race the course or you race the field. Yeah. And depending on how competitive you are with the people that you're racing against and your goals, like if you want to win or if you're just going for a good finish, that completely changes what you'll do here. What I mean by racing the course is uh, you're not worried about a result in terms of finishing relative to anybody else in the field. Instead, what you're trying to do is get the fastest time that you can on that. And in almost every situation, when it's a punchy course or when it's not, in almost every situation, a smoother power output is going to allow you a higher average speed in almost every scenario. If you look at yep. what best bike split, for example, what they would recommend on courses like this, it kind of gives you a bracket and it allows you to raise your power within that bracket on the climbs. And then, but you don't coast on the descents. You try to keep that power going because you can maintain a lot of speed for relatively low effort when you do that. So it's kind of like giving uh, yourself brackets to work within based on the climb, based on a flat and based on a descent. And then you allow yourself to drift within those. Uh, what this will look like is that your normalized power and average power will be closer than they would otherwise at the end of the race. So that's like a good sign if you've done it. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend comp if you're going to race the course, compartmentalize it. You have climbs, you have downhills, you have flats bracket that, and then just adjust within those based on what you're doing. And if you go into that race and you're feeling too tired, then you simply just drop down those brackets. Uh, for example, what that might look like, it might be 200 to 220 watts on the climbs. And then when I go on the descents, I'm going to drop down to 160 to 180 watts. And when I'm on the flats, I'm going to try to keep it at 180 to 200. And you just kind of stay within those. That can be a good way to manage that. But when you start racing the field, it changes a lot. You have to analyze the course ahead of time to know where you're vulnerable, but also where you're strongest. And then from there, you also have to really analyze your competition and know, and try to try to make your best guess as to what they're going to do in that race. And then at that point, it starts to become a game of being efficient. So sagging climbs, not taking wind whenever you don't have to. Uh, and then also being really decisive, I think is important if you're doing that too. Don't halfway attack. Don't do these little things that you are half committed to and you'll just see how they work out. Pick something and go all in on it. And if it doesn't work out, then you reset. But don't go halfway into things. When you're racing the field, that's absolutely what you have to do. And I think average speed, if you're gonna be going above 13 miles an hour, you and you end up having to err more toward racing the field because you have to spend less time in the wind. If it's lower than that, you probably don't have to worry a whole lot. And I think the last tip is just nutrition. Like you just have to make sure that you are fueling that because it's really demanding work. So Pete, I know you have to head out really soon, but punchy courses, that's your ability to punch and recover is like one of your strengths. So what tips would you have in this case? Yeah, I think um, the decisiveness that you mentioned is almost the most important thing um, you can, you can predict what people will do, but if you stick to your plan and do what you're going to do, you'll, you'll be amazed at how different things happen to different people. Um, like all the, if you're kind of forging ahead, the race sorts itself out. And if you're sticking to your plan and it's something you can do, uh, it really, really lends itself to you setting yourself up for success over and over. And you'll be surprised how little how, how few people are able to kind of respond and do the things uh, that maybe get them out of their comfort zone and they blow up or they can't make the make the calls in that same like hard decision they're going to halfway close something and yeah, that's going to on these punchy climbs doing what you need to do um, it's almost like you know the fastest way for you to do this punchy course do that and see how everybody else stacks up against that and you'll be really surprised what it looks like at the end or the last half um, sticking to that plan. Mm -hmm.
probably means going easier on the climbs than you think and going harder on yeah. the flats and downhills than you think. I would, I Nate, would any, concur. Yeah, yeah you agree, Feet. <laughs> Nate, any tips? No. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. <laughs> Good luck to everybody at Schwam again doing that race. Uh, stay within yourself, but also be decisive and make thing make it count. And good luck to everybody else that's racing, training. If you want to get faster, go to trainerroad.com, sign up. It's what everybody does to get fast. Go check it out. Check us out on the Trainer Road forum on our YouTube channel, trainerroad or youtube.com slash trainerroad, and we will talk to you next week. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Bye-bye. See you guys. <laughs>